everybody, and welcome to Build Meets World. This is our new platform for being able to get out and engage with all of you on a regular basis. So welcome to our very first broadcast. Um, I'm, I'm out in the world, but really just in Cleveland at our test facility coming to you uh, live today. So excited about the opportunity. Like we have been doing all these last 85 segments of being able to engage with all of you. And now we're going to do just that. So we're going to get out into the world with Build Meets World and have conversations with you that are relevant in the industry. So to kick us off uh, in, in this month of March, we thought we'd talk some, about something specific in the industry, and that is um, air barrier requirement. So um, we are going to feature somebody that I went out into the field with to talk to. Um, but once again, we're excited to be able to have you all here joining me today and our guest contributors. So. Um, I think this is going to be a good topic for all of you. I think you're going to have a lot of questions, and it's just part one of a four-part series. So welcome to Build Needs World, and I, of course, am Marcy Tyler, the Director of Building Science, your host on this journey. Speaking of journeys, um, as we mentioned, our new format is all about getting out into the world. So what did I do? I traveled from Cleveland, Ohio to Austin, Texas to talk to this guest contributor, of content um, for today's Build Meets World. Our guest contributor is Keith Simon. He has been a frequent contributor uh, for Trump Go Live in the past. He is a great uh, individual in terms of being able to connect with uh, us and, and, and the industry in terms of his knowledge and his experience. So we're really excited to be able to have Keith on today. Our topic, as I mentioned, is all about the requirements of the air barrier. Now, we don't have a guide specification to help us outline what those requirements are. So what we all kind of use is these four pillars. They are air impermeability, durability, structural integrity, and continuity. So Keith and I are gonna talk through this uh, for today's broadcast. And then, like I said, it's a four part series. So stay tuned for more contributors as we continue to talk about these requirements of the air barrier. So Keith, on uh, your birthday Eve, I wanted to get together with you um, as I love uh, I love the, the time we get to have together to talk about different types of industry content. Um, and today, especially because we've got a lot of good things in the works together, but specifically I want to talk to you about, um, you know, the evaluation of air barrier systems. OK, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as Marcy knows, there's. Um... Nothing I enjoy more than on my birthday than to talk about building science. So th this is a treat. Exactly, it's a treat. It's an extra special treat. That's for sure. So, um, you know, it's interesting when we talk about air barriers in general. You know, I I don't think anyone questions why anymore as they did maybe five, ten years ago. But what do you think about just this this comment here, this question? Why do we install an air barrier? Yeah, that's that's great because, um, you know, for a long time in the industry, we were kind of wrapped around the axle about vapor barriers and studying vapor barriers and trying to install them on buildings. And then um, and then at a certain point, it's like the industry realized, wait, we're talking about the wrong thing. We should really be focusing on air barriers. That's what's really important. And sure, um, vapor retarders have their place and um, you definitely want to avoid putting them in the wrong place that can cause some problems. But in terms of um, maximizing energy efficiency, comfort, um, and durability on a building, air barriers are arguably the most critical component. Uh, sure, insulation, continuous insulation too, but um, I like to think of the analogy like in, in a really cold Cleveland day, blistery, windy snow, if you went outside with your big wool sweater, you'd be freezing cold, right? Because the air is just tearing through. You have to have a windbreaker of some sort in combination with that insulation or it's doing nothing for you. Well, the same thing on our buildings. We can't ignore the air barrier and only do insulation or we're not making any progress. Exactly. It's it's choosing the right jacket for your building. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and it's interesting because, you know, as we talk about air barriers and like you said, you know, there was a lot of conversation about vapor barriers and now we're talking a lot about air barriers and a lot of people even say they're water barriers too, right? We want to make sure there's a, a water a water barrier element, right, for the liquid water. But we use these general requirements to kind of guide us. So air impermeable, structural integrity, durability, and continuity is, is kind of our guiding path as we, we start to look at performance of air barriers. Talk to me a little bit about these 
these requirements and I, we, we could spend hours and today you're only, we're going to talk further about air and permeability, but just give me your, your, your feedback on this, this information. Sure. So, um, air impermeable, um, is, is good to isolate that requirement that, um, a different requirement for a membrane might be water resistive barrier or waterproofing. Um, another one is vapor permeability, um, or another one could even be if it's if we're talking about spray foam, it could even be insulation in addition. And so um, sometimes a membrane is one of these things or two or three or even four. Um, or if, if it's just air impermeable, for example, um, sheathing uh, can be air impermeable. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have a membrane on it. So the isolating the air impermeable requirement is is an important sort of uh, a first principle here. And then um, durable and structural integrity, I think, are um, make a lot of common sense, right? Like uh, if peanut butter is a great air barrier, but it you know <laughs> doesn't last very long, we're not getting anywhere. So that those are those are important factors. And then continuity is a really important thing when we're talking about air barriers. So um, if I'm comparing, let's say, an air barrier to a vapor retarder, and uh, let me give you an example, um, the plastic sheet under a concrete slab um, is a vapor retarder. And let's say the, the construction guys walk over it and puncture a whole bunch of holes in it, and you only have about 90% continuity because they've put 10% of it is now punctured holes it's still about 90% effective. You, you, you know, in a very rough rule of thumb, uh, continuity, you generally want continuity, but it's not mission critical. Now with an air barrier, you put your air barrier on the wall and the guys put fasteners and tear and rip it and, you, and they puncture 10% of it, it might be completely worthless. Air is a, it's a fluid medium with the way convection and air works. So that if you if you don't have continuity, you can completely short circuit it. So continuity with an air barrier is really, uh, really critical. Well, I, I think it's interesting because even though today we're going to take a deeper dive into air impermeability, it is so important to look at all these aspects, right? These four and more as you're starting to compare what you're going to use and the performance you're going to get out of that assembly. And I love the peanut butter analogy because, yes, it may be able to stop airflow, but is it going to be able to perform long term? No. Right. So those are those are great analogies and how we holistically look at look at performance. And I think. The conversation has gone to you know, maybe, I don't want to say critical, but to a level of, of understanding because not only are we looking at all these considerations when we look at our system, we also have to know there's different technologies out there and there's lots of technologies that we can utilize and utilize successfully, but we got to go back to the basic, basics when we're choosing those. So is there a preferred air barrier technology? I always like to say it's based on your building the performance needs, and then just collaboratively working together. And I'm not asking you to choose one, but what are your comments as you start to look at what's preferred? Yeah, I mean, um, all technologies have their pros and cons. Yep. Um, yep. So like uh, fluid applied uh, has some great advantages, but also some negatives, right? You're relying yep. on the craftsmanship in the field. A self-adhered membrane, um, has great pros and cons. You don't, you're less reliant on the craftsmanship in the field, but then it can be a lot trickier to make uh, tricky penetrations, transitions, origami in the field. So you might have to integrate with the fluid applied anywhere, anyways. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a mechanically fastened uh, WRB um, uh, has its place for sure. But it's always not going to be as high performance as those other ones that a fluid applied or a self adhered sheet is always going to be just just tighter um, than a, a mechanically fastened sheet. But obviously it's it's more cost effective and it can be done well. It, it may not be as airtight as those other options, but it can still certainly meet code. You can even you know meet some of the above code. Uh, standards out there and it can certainly when installed right be um, water resistive. Um, yeah. So it, it can meet those and, and if, you know, financially um, those other options aren't on the table, um, those those can be done right. Uh, what's interesting about these images, I like there's some other air barrier options that are typically what we think of as air barrier technologies like concrete, for example. So 
if it's a uh, precast concrete, as long as it's, according to the Precast Institute, as long as it's three inches or thicker, it qualifies as your air barrier and your uh, a vapor retarder and a uh, water resistive barrier. Um, it's interesting though, that it has to be precast. So if it's cast in place, it may not qualify. And that's because of all the uh, challenges of the, the, or the craftsmanship that you're relying on. Well, if it's cast in place and it's done perfectly, it's an air barrier, but if it's not well consolidated concrete or there's bug holes or there's honeycombing or there's a lot of cracking, it can be really porous. So you you may you you likely do not want to rely on it as your air barrier. And then of course, um, spray foam shown on the on the lower left there uh, depends on whether it's open cell or closed cell, but at a certain thickness, and I forget, depends on the manufacturer, but mm -hmm. probably like one inch of closed cell or three inches of of open cell does qualify as an air barrier. Um, and depending on the thickness may or may not qualify as a vapor retarder and different R values per inch. So a lot of different um, possibilities there as well. Well, and, it, and I think it's interesting. You, you brought up so many great comments here as it relates to all these different technologies is it's, it's like for your building in your background right now, that might need something different depending on its transitions and its connections and where it's being built. And is it on the coast? And, you know, how many stories is it, right? That starts to bring in other factors. Craig Wetmore, you know, one of our great industry colleagues does a presentation on flashing and he says, you know, here's all these technologies and they all can work, but you need to focus on why you're using them, where you're using them and how you're installing them. So I think it's just great, some great feedback. Because of the complexity, of what we're dealing with, with all these different types of technologies um, and, and how we start to decide which is going to work best for our project, I, I put these six criteria together. So once again, poor Keith, these are my six and I'm asking him to kind of comment on them here uh, on the fly. But, I, you know, I really value your opinion as we start to look at, you know, all these different technologies and all these types of buildings we're building out there and all the challenges we're facing. We, I thought we just kind of run through these six for um, for our program today. So let's have at it. So first one up, and of course, these are pictures I chose that, you know, but still, you know, speak beyond what you see here. Our first topic is exposure. Yeah, so um, one of the realities of construction, right, is it's not going to get covered up with cladding right away. And so how long it can be exposed to ultraviolet light or, or the elements is is a real factor. And there are some products out there um, that um, maybe have a slightly higher cost, but can be um, either indefinitely exposed to UV or exposed for an extremely long time. And that's a major advantage um, to construction that the, you know, if the project uh, construction schedule, the cladding got delayed one month, that you're not, you know, completely screwed on that project and have to redo yeah. it all. Um, so looking for that, um, uh, there, there's um, I, definitely the Tremco Exoair 230 is is a is a great one. Uh, that's one I put on my house with my own <laughs> with my own hands. Um, and I think there's a couple other out there. And I'm not being coy and forgetting those. I, I honestly forgot uh, which the other ones are. But that's a yeah. really important attribute. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what's so interesting. So when when putting when, when thinking about exposure, right? There's there's exposure during construction, there's exposure throughout the life of the building, there's temperature, you know, there's humidity, there's UV. So you touched on all of those. So there's lots of things to consider. And that's part of how you're how you're going to choose that system that works for you. Right. And and I threw in a picture of the scaffolding being stacked up against the air barrier. Right. So not only exposure of the elements, but what's going on around it. Right. So all of those factors is is part of, you know, people like you and I working together with that whole, you know, project team in order to decide, you know, what's going to work best for our application. Um, and then I love my, the, the roof to wall. That's always going to be something that we always want to take a look at, right? So how are we making that connection there, which we will talk about connectivity, but, but how is that connection also affected during exposure, right? So whether, whether it's going to come in during construction and what do we need to make sure that we're protecting is, is all key key parts of choosing. Um, that that lovely blister there, um, that was actually a project where a, a hurricane came through and loaded up the concrete behind it. And that air barrier did everything it could to, to be that negative side waterproofing, right? So it, it would never see that kind of exposure, but it's just thought provoking to kind of put those things up there. And I think 
with any of these things, that's why this partnership works, right? So Keith, if you're on the job site and you're seeing something like this happen, even though we 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 vetted out what was going to work, then we work together to say, hey, how do we how do we fix what's out there, or do we just leave it alone and 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 allow it to dry and whatnot? So, and and you don't, I know you know what snow is. You don't see much of it now, but right there, there's there's other considerations when we're thinking about when we're building, right? And it could go from a warm climate all the way into the cold climate during construction. And, and how does that affect our wonderful material selection, right? The the next one is fire resistance. So I know this has always been a hot topic, um, not to be too silly about it, right? Because it's, it's, it's a life safety situation, but there's still a lot of unknowns out there as it relates to fire resistance. Um, and and so just talk to me a little bit about, you know, this part of our, our choosing of our technologies. Yeah, so um, I think you, you might have to teach me a little bit about this, Mar Marcy, but um, from my, my perspective for NFPA 285 and meeting the requirements here, insulation is a much bigger factor on the selection here and what's being specified, because obviously the, um, the uh, the foam uh, uh, plastic uh, technologies, which are really critical for achieving continuous insulation, are flammable. And so we have to account for this. Not that they can't be used, of course, but that we have to make sure that the they meet the NFPA 285 test, or you know, you select mineral wool that's not flammable, et cetera. Um, and that um, part of the calculation is how flammable the WRB is. But my my understanding is that the WRB um, or or the air barrier um, is playing a, a much less significant role in terms of how flammable versus the insulation. Uh, but let me know if I'm if I'm off base on that one. No, well, you're you're absolutely right in terms of you know as we look at that entire assembly, right? So um, being that our topic is air impermeable, all of these factors come into play, right? So we need to make sure that if, if we're choosing a system, it can, yes, it, we wanna make it meet the fi fire resistance, but we don't wanna compromise its ability to be an air barrier, right? So we could go one route and say, hey, you know, um, I, I can use this, this assembly for my fire resistance, but maybe I'm compromising the overall performance that I really need from an air impermeability perspective. But you're right, and the insulation plays a much bigger role, and, and the insulate and the air barrier itself is such a small, when you think of mill thickness, we're contributing, but all elements in that assembly will um, affect the overall performance and need to be considered. But you're absolutely right, insulation is going to be a bigger factor, and that's why that, that word collaboration, right, we, we work with a lot of different um, manufacturers for those areas that we touch and we connect when we get these assemblies together, and, and there's just so many different ways to construct. Uh, today, once again, not just the technologies, right, but the substrates and then all of our cladding attachments and so on. Um, it's just important. I think the biggest takeaway is is just what you mentioned about that assembly, right? So if anything gets changed and we want to still have a compliant NFPA 285 system, we need to address those changes um, within that assembly. So it just kind of all, it, it contributes back, contributes back to that, to that one pillar um, of requirements. Um, that air impermeability, of course, and then meeting this this one of the six, which is fire. So, somewhat of a loaded a loaded area here where we, okay. could, we could do a much longer conversation as it relates to just this. But I think it's just one more of those elements. We don't want to have people just focus here and then potentially compromise their air barrier continuity or their impermeability and overall performance, right? Because God forbid we don't want you to test the fire resistance of um, your assembly and, and not meet what it needs to, but every single day the building is being tested for its air barrier performance, mm -hmm. right? So just just that, I think you and I had that conversation when I just was out there with you in Austin, you know, like I wear my sweater every day, every day I could be cold or hot and hopefully I, you know, never have to test its fire resistance, right? But I, every day I might be cold, you know, and inefficient. So just something there to consider. Um, and then thickness. So Thickness is, you know, as we look at our technologies, right? Like you, you were mentioning, if if the if the the precast is a is a certain thickness, it, it becomes an air barrier. If the insulation spray foam is a certain thickness, it becomes that air barrier. Um, all these technology comes in different thicknesses, right? So talk to me just as that starts to factor in on performance. Yeah, I think the thickness of the of the membrane is really, really probably one of the most critical um, factors that um, when we um, give recommendations to architects of what to put in their specifications, 
um, that were, um, you know, um, there we kind of think of it in three general character uh, categories of like thick, thicker membranes, middle and thin ones. So the middle being, let's say, like 10 to 20 mils and that um, the thicker ones, I mean, we'd like to have like 30 mils or more. Um, and then the thin mills are less than than 10 mils. And, and the thing is, the, the thickness just really plays a significant factor. There's more room for error. So, for example, the thin mill manufacturers, um, like there's one that's very common on the marketplace that um, after it dries, its dry film thickness is 6.5 mils. I mean, that is so thin that when it's it dries on the on the sheeting, you can read all the words right behind it. I mean, it's it's like as thin or thinner than a piece of paper. And so, and they'll give you all the test data that was, look, it shows it's air impermeable, um, it, it works great. And all that's true in a lab, but these are fluid applied uh, put out on the field where sometimes they spray a little too much material and then they spray a little too little material and then it's bridging a seam and then the building moves and then it cracks. There's no room for error. And there was, um, one year where I had, um, I was doing uh, litigation assistance on four projects and three of the four um, had contributing factors because of thin mill fluid applied um, uh, air barrier systems. So um, just by having a thicker membrane, every time a faster, I mean, if you think about cladding, a lot of times you'll have thousands and thousands of little uh, screw punctures all over your air barrier. Well, if it's a screw and it's going through a thicker membrane, there's just more gasketing that goes on. If it's really thin, it's there's more of a chance of a of a of a hole or a penetration or or a leak or and the, and the leak can bring not just air but the air brings moisture as well. So um, the thicker the better in in terms of uh, of air barriers and water resistant barriers. Exactly. So going going back to that whole idea of if we're looking at air and permeability. Thickness is going to make a difference here, right? Are we having a continuous film and not having any voids? So some of the pictures up here are just some of the things we can look at, right? You know, how how well can it handle different types of puncture resistance? Because if it gets punctured, then it's not air impermeable anymore. It has a hole in it, right? And then when it is punctured, how does it gasket around that penetrating item? And, you know, flexibility, tensile strength. That's why I got that little dog bone up there. You know, all of, like if, if it gets put to the test, can it stay and perform or will it break and no longer be air impermeable? Because now there's a hole in it, right? And then that middle picture is a microscopic image of what we were doing when we were trying to figure out exactly how much butyl is needed on, on the back of our XOR 110AT. And we wanted it to get into the nooks and crannies of certain types of substrates. So substrates are gonna impact you know, is it going to be absorbed into the CMU? Is it going to be absorbed into the sheathing? And then what's remaining from a thickness perspective? And do we have a comfort level that it's going to be thick enough to be all that it needs to be as that air barrier, right? So that's, there's so much, once again, I think we could just talk for hours just about thickness. So thought provoking questions, great dialogue there. And it goes back to that conversation of making sure that what you're choosing is is right for the performance of your building and what you, what you need it for. Um, for that for the life of it because what's what's interesting too is like what's the maintenance package you know what's the maintenance uh for an air barrier there isn't any right like we're not no one's going back to hey can you keep can you go out and remove that cladding and maintain that air barrier for me it's, it's not happening it can't we don't want to be removing the cladding so we got to make sure we're choosing it for all these reasons and of course that thickness so that you've got that robust membrane there um the next one up is compatibility. So I threw up a couple questions, a couple pictures here as it relates to compatibility. Talk to me about this and in, in our air barrier world. Yeah, so um, compatibility, of course, is important. So it's it's important to stick with the system, right? So um, uh, whoever the system is, so you you have. Um, let's say it's it's one manufacturers in the field and then all of their components you want to use their components their self-adhered membranes their sealants everything so that it all has been tested and proven to be compatible um i always cringe when i walk into a job site and usually it's a residential job site we don't we don't, our company doesn't do a lot of residential consulting so it's usually like my neighbors <laughs> and i see the construction projects going on their house and it'll be like tyvek and then Home Depot self-adhered membrane, 
and then some un unidentified sealant and then zip tape. I mean, it's like a little, little hodgepodge of everything. And it's just kind of a roll of the dice. Um, nobody's tested those compatibilities to make sure uh, that not only that they're going to stick, but they're going to stick for the long time. Like it's OK. It's not OK if it sticks for two years. I mean, what if it sticks for five years and then starts to fall apart? Right. That's that's a that's a terrible failure. So um, these, these things need to be a part of a system um, and uh, stick with stick with one manufacturer, uh, you know, maintain that warranty throughout. Well, it's 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 interesting because I think it, it is hard when all when different products are coming together um, from different manufacturers. So what we usually say as a manufacturer, we'll make comment on compatibility to the best of our ability. We're we're going to be looking at that other manufacturer's technical information just like you would. But there's stuff that you just don't know if you're not really the manufacturer, and and that's what that bottom picture there is. We did a test on three polyurethane sealants with three different results when it came to this AMA test. So that can be scary, right? Like if, if you can't bucket them based on technology, then what do we need to do? And that's just that impart, important part of partnering with your manufacturer so that you can get that type of knowledge. The limitations are just as important as the performance criteria. You don't want to put two things together that are incompatible. And, and maybe it doesn't happen right away, like you said, maybe it happens over time. But if they don't, if they stop adhering and they're not compatible, then we're not going to have an air impermeable system, which could affect it. Um, the picture on the far uh, left there is a silicone sealant underneath an asphaltic membrane. So in that instance, they're compatible. There's no incompatibility of an asphalt membrane over silicone, but they just didn't adhere, right? So all these questions, right? So oh, that was compatible. I'm good. But it didn't adhere, which will be our next thing we talk about. Um, so th all of these factors come into play uh, when we look at things. And the middle picture is a uh, curing cabinet that we have when we do different types of material testing. And we will put them in different cabinets even to cure. So that just shows like it may not even be touching. It may be in proximity and might potentially have an incompatibility issue. So communication, working together, collaboration. That way we can make sure everyone's aware of all these things that could happen um, when things come together. And of course, that leads us to that whole idea of adhesion, right? So verifying adhesion of two things coming together. Talk to me about this. Yeah, um, so let's see um, where to start. Well, um, just to, to piggyback on one thing you were saying is um, sure. that it's inevitably a challenge on um, you stick with one manufacturer's system, but inevitably two different manufacturers products are going to lap where you need strong adhesion. And so what we'll usually do is require the project team get a, a letter um, from both manufacturers mm -hmm. saying that they they accept that um, transition. And we may have to do, like you said, testing to, to, to yeah. show, to demonstrate it. Um, it could be um, on-site adhesion testing. Um, this pull testing um, that's uh, one, two, three, four inches in is, is one way to go, um, which can be pretty useful to just prove that. Um, we, we can do a bubble test um, where we, we put the bubble, pull, pull air pressure. Oh, well, first we put like a, a soapy um, mix on, on it. And then if when we're pulling pressure, we can kind of spot. And that can be really useful. Um, we usually don't see issues in the field of the membrane. But to put that bubble test over like a transition from this manufacturer to that manufacturer or at a penetration, at a brick tie, at a, a joint or something like that and just kind of double check that um, we do have air barrier continuity at that condition can be a useful test. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting because, you know, we do that often, right? We, we, we do different types of testing or we write different letters because, you know, as much as we'd like it, if we were every bit of that building, right, Key? Tremco everywhere, it's not gonna <laughs> happen all the time. And you know when that comes into play, it is great to to work collaboratively together to to make sure we're we're getting a good a good adhesion. Um, so we can do field testing, as you mentioned, mentioned, or even lab testing. So what's interesting as we continue to add our portfolio, imagine the adhesion and compatibility testing we have to do, and that's what the two images on the far ends are. Just the complexity of saying, okay, if, if I have this one product as the substrate, like if I put that coating down first, how many different connections do I have? And then I need to test it for high temperature, low temperature, immersion, UV, like just it goes on and on and on. And that's why we had the, the, the numerous samples. And then the insulated concrete form in the middle there is some testing we did um, with lots of different 
uh, like flashing tapes and sealants, and we did it over exposure. So not only do you have to do it at time zero, you have to do it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or how long you want that product to be exposed for, and how does that impact adhesion? So the complexity is there, but the, the collaboration is how we can answer those questions. So it's definitely a key part. Of, of making sure this all comes together. And speaking of it all coming together, um, our sixth item of conversation as it relates to air impermeability of our membranes is connectivity. So I got some, some photos up there of, about just that, connectivity of people and systems. Yeah, so this is this is a, this is a, a, a great um, collection of images to talk about this subject. So you can specify and install all the the best products in the world. You've got upper middle there, um, fiberglass, cladding attachment clips, Cascadia clips, awesome product and system. You've got um, uh, Exoware 430. Um, all the joints are taped and and uh, sealed. Um, you're going to get the uh, most expensive windows in the wall. It's the most expensive windows in the world and put them put them in there. But <laughs> If you don't integrate that window with the system, remember how critical continuity is and the perimeter of those windows, if they're not integrated correctly, you can really short circuit it and um, lose a lot of the gains you've made with all these other good choices. So um, this was something that um, uh, we collaborated with over the last number of years actually on a, on a research initiative because there's a lot of great information on air barrier systems and a lot of great information on windows themselves, um, uh, but not so much on flanged window installation in commercial construction. Like there's flanged windows for low rise wood frame, vinyl windows, multifamily. There's there's good um, indications of how to install those. Um, and there's good uh, uh, industry information for curtain wall non flanged systems. But there's a new type of window on the market um, that are flanged aluminum windows for high rise construction. And there had been virtually no um, guidance on how to install those. So we did a, a, um, a uh, collaborative um, between Tremco, Terracon, and JE Don Construction uh, Research Initiative um, to help determine best practices um, for air and water tightness of flanged windows in commercial construction. And um, there's two different, the first round of testing was summarized in an ASTM publication. And then we did a kind of a second round of, of testing that was summarized in this IBEC uh, publication that, that Marcy shared on the, on the lower left there. And then um, there will eventually be a round three round of testing yeah. that we're embarking on soon. Yeah. Um, but yeah. we're also um, gonna expand our testing, not just about wind flange window insulation, but also about cladding attachments. Um, and there's a lot of great research out there about the um, thermal loss with cladding uh, attachments, but we're gonna focus our research more on the air and water penetration of different strategies to try to provide some more um, industry best practices. Yeah. It's exciting stuff. And, and you think about all the different connections, but we'll have lots of work to do together, Keith, for all the years to come. So I definitely look forward to that. Um, thank you for uh, for all of your information today. Uh, definitely what we want to be able to do on our new platform here, Build Meets World, is really be thought provoking and, and have this type of dialogue. So we're looking forward to all the questions um, everyone that's watching this has. Um, and, and Keith and I look forward to reaching back out to everybody to, to share that uh, information via you know, personal, personal engagements with all of you or in these industry associations where we'll be presenting this content. So Keith, thank you so much for sharing your uh, words of wisdom with us um, on the eve of your birthday um, with, a, with a topic that is so near and dear to all of us in the industry, which is performance. So thank Great. you, Great, thank you, Marcy. Thanks, oh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. This is part one of a four part series all about air barrier performance. We focused on a lot of different uh, topics today as it relates to air impermeability. Um, next up is going to be continuity, durability, and structural integrity um, as we get out into the world and have these conversations. I know you probably have a lot of questions and I'd love to hear them, so keep them coming. Um, I do um, want to share, of course, my email address there, mtyler at tremcoinc.com. Send me all your questions. Send me all uh, the, the topics you want to hear, um, but we look forward to continuing to engage with you all on Fridays with Build Meets World. Thanks.